<laughs> All right. Well, let us begin in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Dear Heavenly Father, bestow your blessing upon us today as we study the scriptures for this weekend. Inspire us and, and show us exactly how to prepare for the preaching this weekend so that we can fully preach the word of God and touch the hearts of our people with God's word. We ask you to guide us in this session of preparation through Christ our Lord, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Well, our very first reading, it comes from Exodus chapter 17. Uh, and the context is really simple. The uh, Israelites have been in the desert on their journey going towards Mount Sinai. So they're, they're, they've left Egypt. And right after leaving Egypt, suddenly there's desert there. Uh, and what's so, so funny about their um, beginning journey in the desert is that right after they, they left Egypt, they sang this amazing song of praise with Moses and then Miriam. And it was, it, it's this song giving thanks to God for his salvation. And right after that beautiful act of praise, they turn around and they start journeying in this desert. And, and it really kind of typifies life, you know, that at one moment we're on a high and then the, ne the next moment it's one spiritual battle after another spiritual battle. And so in, on three occasions, the Lord gave his people, um, he, he turned uh, water that was bitter into sweet water or fresh water. And then he, he gave them manna, and then he gave them water from the rock. So he worked three amazing miracles before this reading that we have today. And so this will be the fourth miracle that he works when the Israelites are battling against the Amalekites. So let's read this reading from Exodus chapter 17. It says, In those days Amalek came and waged war against Israel. Moses therefore said to Joshua, Pick out certain men and go out and engage Amalek in battle. And I will be standing on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him. He engaged Amalek or Amalek in battle. After Moses had climbed to the top of the hill with Aaron and Hur, as long as Moses kept his hands raised up, Israel had the better of the fight. But when he let his hands rest, Amalek had the better of the fight. Moses' hands, however, grew tired, so they put a rock in place for him to sit on. Meanwhile, Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. And Joshua mowed down Amalek and his, and his people with the edge of the sword. And so going back to the very beginning of this reading, the, the context of this reading is that Israel has, you know, just left Egypt a little while ago. They're in the very beginning stages of their desert journey. And as they begin their journey into the desert, God is showing his people that he will care for them as a father cares for a child. And so he's guiding his people, you could say. He turns bitter water into sweet water, gives them the manna, and then he gives them water from the rock. And in this particular case, the, the Amalekites battle with the Israelites. And you can see the importance of prayer in this battle. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, for the Israelites, even warfare itself was a sacred event. And there are specific rules for warfare in the Old Testament that, you know, underlined, you know, that men should be in a, you know, it, you know, they can't have relations with their wife, and they have to be completely set apart for this task of warfare. We haven't gotten to all those rules yet, okay? However, you know, you can, you could, you could see the basic concept here. The basic concept is that it's really the Lord who fights your battles. And this image of physical warfare helps us to understand what Paul talks about when he talks about spiritual warfare. And especially if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and onward, 
Paul says that our real battle that we have, the real battle that we have, is not against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle. Uh, and just as we see that prayer is so important in this physical war, we must understand that in all the spiritual difficulties that we have, whatever those are, problems, difficulties, conflicts, that prayer must be preeminent. Now, in the Old Testament, it was common to hold one's hands up high to heaven when they prayed. And we see how Aaron and her help Moses with his prayer. They're holding up his hands. This really, this really maybe can give us some insights that we have to help others pray. We have to pray with them. We have to set aside time in our own lives for prayer. And when we do, we often recognize more clearly what our Lord wants to do in our lives. Uh, and especially inspiring others to pray, praying with others, not missing those opportunities to pray with family members, friends, or, or others. It could be even at work. Th those, those opportunities for prayer will help others with all the conflicts that they have in their life. And you know, one of the first things I ask people when they come and they, you know, they bring up a certain problem, you know, this is happening in my life. I ask them, you know, have you been able to take this to the Lord in prayer? Have you been able to present this to our Lord in prayer? Honestly, asking our Lord uh, for his help, for his guidance in whatever that situation might be. But we see here, um, if you look at Exodus, it's, it tells us that when Moses had his hands lifted up high, Israel had the better of the fight. But when he let his hands down, Amalek had the better of the fight. And so, you know, you, you kind of see that the text is saying, you know, look at how important prayer was this. The prayer was in this situation. And so Israel is learning as a son learns from their father. What they're really learning about is not really warfare as much as the importance of prayer. Uh, and this is something that we must teach our children. We must teach our children that, you know, when it comes to all of the difficulties that we have in life, that prayer must be preeminent in our life. Jesus gives the most beautiful advice. He says, pray always. And so at that moment, I ask if there's any comments on, on that reading, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I do have some thoughts and some questions. Um, so I, I want to kind of stick with the text for a second here. Um, so, and this is something that's kind of always been a little difficult for me to interpret and especially in contemporary setting because um, when you look at the uh, uh, the warfare uh, that the Israelites are undergoing as they begin their their campaign to um, to take uh, the promised land you know you have these in these mandates by God to mow people down and of course in a, in a modern context this seems like barbaric um, and so this and even to the point where, you know, and I get the, the idea was, you know, you weren't even you weren't even to spare the livestock because that way you'd be, you know, you're taking something that came from um, kind of unclean people and you become ritually impure and you become sort of you're it's kind of idolatry in a way you're valuing the things and you're not putting the Lord first. But um, I just don't know how to address that, you know, if we're talking uh, to people, uh, maybe outside of the homily, if you're talking about just the general concept of that, um, how do you how do you address that? Yeah. You know, when yeah, when, so, you're, when you're talking to people about that, right, right. So basically, it's it's not as vicarious as it sounds from that reading. I I don't like the way that we that that's interpreted. So I'll, I'll give you this. Here's a little bit more liberal, in, uh, not liberal, but a little bit more uh, literal interpretation. And literally. Yeah. The Am Amalekites came and they fought against Israel at Rephidim. So the Amalekites are preventing the Israelites from receiving the promise. They're trying to prevent them from going on their journey. Uh, and so, so that's the so, I'm sorry. So in this instance, they're the aggressor, basically. Exactly. And, and so, you know, and you know, let's take a look at how it, how it's stated in the reading that we have, but. Yeah, so it it, it kind of says, it doesn't say it in the most literal way, Amal, in those days, Amalek came and waged war against Israel. So the Amalekites, are, the Amalekites are the aggressors, 
And they're, they're literally coming to fight these Israelites in the desert, preventing them from going on their, their journey. Um, you know, they're essentially their lives are at risk because they're, they're out of their true homeland. So the Amalekites are the aggressors here, to make a long story short. Okay. They, they're, they're seen. Well, that makes from, it. Yeah, that makes that. Yeah, from the biblical perspective, they're they're seen as the aggressors who want to prevent God's people from inheriting their promises, um, and so they come up again in history. Um, a few, you know, they come up a few more times in history, but this is one of the cases. Another case is when Sal, uh, Saul, the king Saul, attacks them, and he does not implement the ban upon them, and he loses the kingship uh, shortly after that because he disobeyed God on two different occasions. But that's that's a little bit later. Uh, in history, but the, a long story short, they're seen as aggress aggressors, but more than aggressors, they're trying to prevent the Israelites from essentially doing God's will, from inheriting the promise, um, and from continuing their journey. Uh, so that's that's uh, also part of it as well. If, if they should have simply just let Israel pass through. So thank you. Uh, the other question I had uh, was um, what. That when you mention the other events, when you add that to say the events of the Exodus itself, much of this focuses on the fact that it's a kind of a deliverance theme. Mm -hmm. You know, God delivers them from slavery, He delivers them from hunger and thirst, and now He's delivering them from the hands of their enemies. Um, and so that theme seems to run through. Um, a lot of these uh, these texts, which also then is expressed in the Canticle of Miriam, uh, and then how? Because I don't have that text in front of me right now. How faithful is uh, Mary's Magnificat to the original Song of Miriam? We've often been told that it's uh, it's uh, word. I haven't looked it up. Yeah. Is that basically yeah, the same? So, so so you're you're probably referring to the the Canticle of Hannah. Oh, and, Hannah. And, okay, thank yeah, you. Yeah. It, that, and that's that's in First Samuel chapter two, um, and it, it is very there. It is very close. I could send you a chart with some of the similarities. There's probably okay. you know ten ten similarities between you know Hannah's Canticle and Mary's Magnificat. Um, right. But you're but I think you you hit the main theme. Israel is learning about redemption, salvation, uh, God's protection as as a father who cares for them they're they're learning about these themes uh the only problem is is that they're, they're not learning well enough um <laughs> you know as most children are you know they're, yeah. they're 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 willing to accept the benefits but those benefits have are, are not really you know resulting in any type of conversion or growth um so exactly the lord is taking care of them every single one of these situations is an adverse situation uh, where they seem like they're the victims, you know, they're, they, they first run into the bitter water, then there's no food, and then, then there's no water at all, and now the Amalekites are threatening to wipe them out, and in each case, God is protecting them. He's showing, he's showing them, you know, I'm with you, and if I'm with you, and you are obedient to this covenant, you are going to know uh, the Lord's protection. Of course, they haven't made the covenant yet, they're getting ready to make the covenant. So they're, they're learning about God's presence and protection as they're preparing to make the covenant. They're, they're on their way to Sinai. Uh, and it's at Sinai that they will enter into this relationship with God, the covenant relationship, which is the most profound of all relationships because, right. God, because God himself is a partner. And that's what's so amazing about it, that you know, it's it's a it's a covenant relationship with the Lord, not just with any person. Um, and so, so the the reading, you know, you can really talk a lot about prayer, our relationship with God, and you know, is is our life of prayer tied directly to this covenant relationship that we have in Jesus Christ? And if it is, everything becomes important. Going to mass becomes important. <clears throat> Helping the poor becomes important. Forgiving others becomes important. So every aspect of that covenant relationship becomes important. And prayer, of course, is one of the preeminent parts. Well, to that point, and just to kind of further this along, I think the other themes here are obviously perseverance in prayer, right? Um, like perseverance in the battlefield and uh, symbolized by Moses's uh, uplifted hands. 
But the other part is the importance of the community in in assisting uh, and supporting one another. So you have uh, um, uh, Aaron and her, you know, doing their thing, helping Moses when he was fatigued and couldn't continue lifting up his hands. So there's a there's a strong sense of the support of one another in the midst of those trials. And then lastly, the other thing that comes to mind is uh, the idea that um, our, um, uh, our, our bond with God is one that's, uh, it's obviously his initiative. Um, but uh, the other thing is we're, we're, you know, we're good about, you know, lifting up our hands in prayer and praise when things are going well. But, you know, uh, here Moses is being asked to continue even when things are, 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 are stressful. And so in the midst of the trials, that would be really the time when our hands should be lifted up in prayer at that time. And uh, quite often uh, those hands go down <laughs> when, yeah. when things are going bad. It's like, ah, well, you know, God's not listening. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's when, that's when we feel most like, you know, giving up, letting right. go. Um, and, you know, when the, you know, when the spiritual battle is in the most difficult point. Um, absolutely. Well, I, I used I used to have a push lawnmower. You know, you remember those push lawnmowers? <laughs> yes. yes. And when, when I was a little kid, you know, you know, when you're a young child, you really don't always get these readings for what they what they really intend. And it was one of these push lawnmowers where you had to really get a head of steam behind it, and yes. the grass would just go shooting up. And I I just remember pushing this thing and seeing the grass shoot up in the air and thinking of that phrase, you know, Joshua mowed down the you know Amalek. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just kind of wondering what, you know, what was that what was that about but now but now you know you read it now and you say that okay now i see what the reading's really trying to underline it's really trying to underline how god can help me um and help each person in their life of prayer with every adversity that they have in life no matter how uh impossible that adversity might seem um but uh well, right. your relation, your relationship with the mower was different than mine. I wasn't thinking spiritual thoughts with that rusty old mower that could barely move. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That was uh, those are the days, right? Right. Okay. So, so now let's go to Psalm uh, 121. Uh, Father Bruce, would you mind reading it? Do you have? Are you able to? Sure, I can. Let me just see if I can. Uh, there we go. Oh, hey, look at that! I can make that screen bigger. Good for me, because I. My eyeballs don't work as well as they used to. Mm. Okay, from the responsorial psalm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I lift up my eyes toward the mountains. Whence shall come? Whence shall help come to me? My help is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our help is from the Lord who made heaven, heaven and, earth. and earth. May he not suffer your foot to slip. Where'd we go? May he slumber not who guards you. Indeed, he neither slumbers nor sleeps, the guardian of Israel. Our help is help from, is the, from Lord, the Lord who made, who made heaven, heaven and earth. And earth. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your shade. He is beside you at your right hand. The sun shall not harm you by day nor the moon by night. Our, Our help, help is, is from the Lord. From the Lord who made, heaven, who made and earth. heaven and earth. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard your coming and your going, both now and forever. Our help is Our from help the Lord, from who, made who made heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Okay. Well, thank you. So this, this psalm is a psalm of ascent. So literally a psalm of going up. And uh, the, the context of this psalm, scholars believe that pilgrims would sing these psalms as they ascended up towards Jerusalem. So you can just imagine... Um, people from all of Israel coming to Jerusalem uh, during the feast days of the Passover or Pentecost or maybe some other feast day. And, and as they're ascending towards the city, going uphill, they are, imagine them singing this psalm, our help is, in, is from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Um, and, and what's so beautiful, I lift up my eyes to the mountains from where shall my help come to me. Uh, my help is from the, from the Lord who made heaven and earth. 
you know, that where are they, where are they referring to when they say, I lift up my eyes to the mountains? They're referring to the city of Jerusalem, surrounded by little hills, only elevated 2,400 or 2,500 feet above sea level. But they're referring to the place where God dwells in the very midst of his people. And that's what made Jerusalem different than any place on the face of the earth. It was the place where God himself was present in the midst of his people. And so they would recognize, you know, our, our help is from the Lord, and he's the, the one who created all the heavens and all the earth, not like the foreign deities who might be a so-called God of some element or something in creation. Our God is the creator of all of creation, who cannot be manipulated in any way. Uh, and this is very important because many of the foreign deities around Israel it was more like a quid pro quo relationship. You do something, you get something. You try to appease the God or manipulate the God. But with the God of Israel, it's totally different. You, you have to live in covenant relationship with the God of Israel in good times and in bad times. And it's in those difficult times that you trust that in the Lord, can, that that is where you will find help from the Lord, the one who created the heavens and the earth. And so it's it's really part of that covenant relationship that the Israelites learn to place their trust in God. Their God is not a God that could be manipulated like the other gods around them, but he had to be served authentically in the covenant relationship. And so he it goes on and it says, may he not suffer your foot to slip. May he, may he slumber not who guards you. Indeed, he neither slumbers or sleeps, the guardian of Israel. The word guardian of Israel, it's a very famous phrase, Shomer Yisrael. You know, it's like the guardian or protector of Israel, Shomer Yisrael. But the idea here, you see it expressed in the famous battle of the prophets when the prophet Elijah uh, is talking to the prophets of Baal. If you remember that scene back in 1 Kings 18, and, you know, Elijah basically says to all the prophets of the Baal, of Baal, let's see who the real God is. And by the way, why don't you guys take the first shot at it? And he allows the prophets of Baal to go first and, and says, you know, we're going to put a sacrifice out here, but the, only the God who answers with fire is the true God. And so you pray as much as you want, but God, him, the true God has to answer with fire. And of course, after the false prophets of Baal have exhausted themselves and jumped over the sacrifice, putting on quite a show, slashing themselves with knives. Then Elijah kind of starts to, to joke around with them, you know, kind of referring to the fact that, you know, maybe your God is asleep, maybe he's retired, maybe he's using the restroom. And he's, he's kind of having fun with this because the true God of Israel never sleeps or slumbers. And, the, and to us, it's a simple reminder that we can turn to God in prayer anytime. He doesn't sleep or slumber. We can turn to him any moment, any time, no matter what, because God neither sleeps nor slumbers. Uh, and this is something that gives us such confidence in prayer that, you know, at the, at the moment of greatest need, whatever that might be, we can turn to the Lord. Um, the Lord is your guardian. The phrase uh, repeating again, Shomer, Shomer Yisrael, the Lord is your shade. He is beside you at your right hand. The sun shall not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. You know, is he talking about, you know, uh, getting uh, skin cancer here? Um, is that what he's getting at? Or, you know, getting, you know, maybe moonstruck or something? No, he's not talking about that. What he's talking about is that, you know, God, God protects us day and night. He watches over us day and night. That's really what he's getting at, that the sun's not going to harm you by day, nor the moon by night. It's a poetic way of simply saying, the Lord is going to take care of us day and night. So trust the Lord. Put your trust in him. Walk with him. Know that he will protect you. It's a beautiful line that you could you could share with people, you know, because a lot of times people have fear, you know, going to sleep or fear, you know, going out to do their daily activities. The Lord will guard you from all evil. He will guard your life. The Lord will guard your coming and your going both now and forever. And so the image of God guides us on every journey and at every point of our lives. And he guards us, he guards us in every way, especially from anything that can harm us. Um, and so I open it up to you, uh, Father Bruce. Uh, do you have any, any thoughts? Or I think I Well, have... I was going to mention, and I 
think I'm right, but I could be completely off here. But I do think that it's also that reference to the sun and the moon also is kind of a, a reference to the false gods as well, because obviously some of their neighbors um, in the region had sun and or moon worship. And I think that there were a lot of beliefs about even among the Jews about um, bad luck associated with the moon. Um, so I think that that's kind of a, a, um, um, a, a response to that, too, don't you think? I, I would agree, yeah. I mean, Jericho, uh, Yericho, was the city of the moon god, okay? So, you know, right from the, right the get-go, they're dealing with these, these type of issues. Um, and then Elijah the prophet, if you go to, uh, if, I'm sorry, if you go to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel the prophet, if you go to his book and read chapter 8 and chapter 9, he talks about how people were worshiping the sun and they were turning their back on the temple to worship the sun uh, during even during his uh, time period. So we definitely see that that this is in the promised land among the Canaanites, but also the Israelites themselves struggled with these things as well. Thank you. OK. All right. Okay, so Deacon, would you like to like to read uh, the next reading, for, uh, which is from Second Timothy chapter three, fourteen, and onward? Okay. Would you like to read it, Jose? Me? Okay. Yes. Beloved, remain faithful to what you have learned and believe, because you know from whom you learn it. And that from in infancy, for in infancy, or how, how do you pronounce that, Father? Infancy, infancy, infancy. perfect. You have known the sacred scriptures which are capable to give you wisdom from salva for salvation through a faith in Christ Jesus. All the scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching for refutation, for correction, and for training in, in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, 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 mm -hmm. yes. competent. For, yes, yes. Competent, equip, equipped for every good work. I change you in the presence. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And by this appearing and his kingly, kindly power, uh, proclaim the word, be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Convince, pre reprime, encourage through a patience and teaching. Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, so so once again we we go to the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, and if you remember from last week, Paul wrote to Timothy towards the end of his life. He was in prison. In Rome, he spent the last couple years of his life in prison in Rome before he was beheaded for the gospel. Uh, and so, you see a lot of this theme uh, of Paul's imprisonment uh, within this letter, and it's really a beautiful letter to read because you see Paul saying, you know, even though I'm in chains, chains, the gospel can never be chained. And so, Timothy, you young bishop, you must go out there and be faithful to your calling as a bishop. And so Paul's really encouraging Timothy as a young bishop. He also sent Timothy to go to certain places and correct errors. For instance, in the city of Ephesus, where, the, where there was a church in Ephesus, Timothy was sent there. And so now he's talking with Timothy about the scriptures. Remain faithful to what you have learned and believe because you, you know from whom you've learned it, that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures. So that, what a beautiful you know, image that Timothy, you know, had, had learned the scriptures uh, from the time he was very young. 
And, and the scriptures that you've learned are capable of giving you wisdom for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, and so th this scripture is going to help you. It's going to give you wisdom for, for salvation in Christ. And so he goes on, he says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, refutation, for correction, for training and righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So th I love this scripture reading right here, all scripture is inspired by God. It does not teach sola scriptura, which, which some try to get out of this. It doesn't teach sola scriptura. But I think as Catholics, this is something we really should take to heart here because it underlines the central importance of Scripture uh, in all that we do, especially in teaching refutation of any kind of errors for correction and for training in righteousness. So it, it underlines how Scripture should be a central part of not just our ministry as priests because we teach the gospel and proclaim the gospel, but also a central part of the life of every single Catholic Christian. Uh, and, and so, you know, we can encourage people to develop a habit of reading Scripture, to make Scripture part of their devotional practices, to, you know, to have Bibles that are in their home that are open, and, and to develop a practice of reading Scripture on a regular basis, so that the one who belongs to God may be competent and equipped for every good work. So then Paul goes on and he, and he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and by his peering in his kingly power, proclaim the word. Uh, and these, this, this sentence right here uh, is so beautiful. Just imagine Paul, you know, writing this to Timothy, a young bishop, and saying, you know, in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our judge, I charge you to go and proclaim the word. He's He's basically saying, Timothy, don't hold back. Don't be timid. You know, go out and embrace this vocation that you have as a young bishop in the church and live it in the absolute fullest way possible. Uh, and I, I think that each one of us who preaches the word of God, whether you're a deacon or a priest, even lay people who teach within the church, that they, that they can really take to heart this uh, instruction here. That you know, we we have an obligation to help others to understand the word of God and to proclaim the word of God in all of its fullness. And and the beauty is proclaiming the word of God. It's it's more than just teaching as well, because when we proclaim the word of God, we have to we have to proclaim the beauty of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, and in our lives become a living testimony of what the gospel is. Uh, and so Paul simply, after, after giving Timothy that great instruction, proclaim the word, be persistent, whether it is convenient or inconvenient. And, and that's something we're going to find. Sometimes it's just going to seem very inconvenient. Other times it'll be convenient. And then convince, reprimand, which means to correct people, encourage through all patience and teaching. And the last part, I think, is you know, I, I think it's very easy to think of, you know, I want to convince people and I want to rep reprimand people. I think most, most people don't have a problem with those two. But the last part here, encourage through all patience, encouraging through all patience and teaching. And, you know, to really um, proclaim the scriptures, it really requires a lot of patience on our part. Uh, it, it really does. And, and it, inquire, it, it also uh, requires us to encourage people. We, we come across so many people who are suffering and they're broken. And, and when we talk with them about the gospel and the beauty of the gospel, sometimes they're just, their attitude changes. Um, and so I think that this is something that we can take uh, in, uh, to our own ministry, the, the concept of encouraging others in Christ and, and also being patient with others as we walk with them and help them to know, love, and serve Jesus. Uh, so I open it up to your comments on this reading. Any any thoughts or comments on 2 Timothy? Okay. Very good. Well, let's let's move on then. Let's let's go to the gospel acclamation. Um, and I think I'll just go ahead and read this one if that's okay. Alleluia, sure. alleluia. 
The word of God is living and effective, discerning reflections and thoughts of the heart. Alleluia, alleluia. And from the gospel of Luke, Jesus told his disciples a parable about the necessity for them to pray always without becoming weary. He said there was a judge in a certain town who neither feared God nor respected any human being. And a widow in that town used to come to him and say, render a just decision for me against my adversary. For a long time, the judge was unwilling. But eventually he thought, while it is true that I neither fear God nor respect any human being, because this widow keeps bothering me, I shall deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. The Lord said, pay attention to what the what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. So in, in this parable, what's, what's amazing about this story is it you, you start off with this character who seems kind of despicable. He's, he's a judge, but he doesn't even fear God. And he doesn't even respect human beings. And, and so what are the two commandments that are the, that are the foundation of the entire law? Love God above all things and love your neighbor as yourself. So he's the polar opposite of what we would want to be as people. Um, because the foundation of the law and the prophets is to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. And this judge is the exact opposite of that. He's, he, he, and so he seems like the most despicable type of person. Why would Jesus use this type of person uh, in a parable? Because by showing us uh, the, the opposite quality of this judge, this judge who's nothing like God, uh, who doesn't even fear God, who doesn't respect human beings, he wants to help us to understand how loving our Father is in heaven and how much confidence we should have in our Father who's in heaven, when, especially when we pray. And so this widow comes to him, and she, she asks for a decision uh, in her favor against her adversary. adversary. And, and the judge, he's just simply unwilling. You know, and, and he, he doesn't want anything to do with it. But eventually he thought, you know, you know, what, it, it is true. I don't fear God and I don't respect any human being. But because this widow keeps bothering me, I'm going to deliver a just decision for her, lest she finally come and strike me. And so it's because this woman is so persistent. She is absolutely so persistent that this terrible, despicable person will even give her justice because of her persistence. And, and so when we read this, we should stop and say, wow, you know, God is the opposite of this. God, you know, he loves us. He cares for us. He created us. He's the opposite of this judge. So if we are persistent in prayer, we don't go to an unjust judge. We don't go to a judge who's a despicable person, but we go to our father who truly cares and loves for us and wants what's best for us. And so our Lord says, pay attention to what the dishonest judge says. Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen one? So when we go to the Lord, we, we, we need to go with this attitude. We, we go to the one who is who's a true benevolent father, a true benevolent father. And, and so we see the opposite of a dishonest judge, but a benevolent father when we go to our Lord. And so... Uh, what also is beautiful is, will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him day and night? They call out to him day and night. Will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, lost my place right there. Just a moment. Okay. Okay, will he be slow to answer them? I tell you, uh, he will see to it that justice is done for them speedily. Now, so God, he answers our prayer. We, we must be persistent. 
And, and especially when we turn to the Lord in prayer, the question that I have for people this weekend is, what is the image that you have of God when you turn to our Lord in prayer? Do you see a benevolent father? Do you, uh, do you, do you turn to a benevolent father? Do you understand the Lord as a benevolent father who loves you and cares for you and wants the best for you? Or do you have the image of this judge who just doesn't want to be bothered? That's not how God is. God is not like that judge who doesn't want to be bothered. He's, he's the most benevolent father we can ever imagine. Um, but then at the very end, it's kind of interesting. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? When Christ returns to this world, will there be faith on this earth? So let me get your comments on this. Any thoughts? I'm just uh, glad that there is a very clear connection between the first reading and the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to draw those, those connections with the idea of persevering right. in our petitions. And uh, interestingly enough, that theme I mentioned about deliverance, you know, we talked about the desert struggles, you know, mm -hmm. as they're going through and uh, being delivered from bondage, mm -hmm. hunger, thirst, war. And now um, this, uh, this widow needs to be delivered from her, right. her you know, her, her opponent, right? Mm -hmm. And she even needs to be delivered from this, um, this unjust judge. And, uh, but even so, I mean, the judge himself, even though he's wicked, uh, he still does it. And so the point being naturally that, well, mm -hmm. if, if a human being who's filled with corruption can, can do that just because Mm -hmm. they're tired of of being bothered how much more will god respond mm -hmm. to his own children absolutely yeah and, and you know really the concept of god as our father it's in the first reading and also in the second in the gospel because essentially that's how god is is caring for his uh son israel uh when moses went to the pharaoh he was sent to the pharaoh with the message Israel is my firstborn son, let my son go. Um, and so it's, it's a father who cares for his firstborn son. And then they, when they enter the desert, you see God acting like a father, caring for his child. Um, and, you know, this, this concept of, you know, who is God, I think it's, it's so important. You know, just to, who is God for you? Do you really understand and relate to God as a, a benevolent father who loves you? Uh, because Israel, even in the desert, they didn't always, you know, uh, understand this connection. Uh, and I and I think that we we can still even say today that you know people struggle with this sometimes. They they sometimes think of God more as a just a judge uh, rather than a father who cares for them. Um, but you're right. The concept of uh, persistence in prayer, uh, you, you see it in in both readings and in the gospel. Any other, th other thoughts? I think also about the, like in the first reading, the call of uh, the community get together to pray God, the, uh, because uh, Moses cannot uh, stay all the time with his hands up. So he need somebody else to help him in the prayer of, of God so he can, uh, keep continuing in prayer and and that's why sometimes uh or most of the time we need somebody else with pray with us and and ask god for our needings not stay all the time by myself but recognize that the the community the family is is very important to to be together uh in, in front of god absolutely very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you know, really, every reading has a has a lot to do with prayer. The first reading, the se the second, the responsorial psalm, which is which is a psalm of ascent, going up to Jerusalem, and you know the 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 manner in which they would prepare as they approached Jerusalem and the temple, putting all of their trust in the Lord. The second reading were. Paul is talking to Timothy about scripture, his ministry, and uh, the, the, the presence of scripture in his ministry. You could 
probably mentioned something about, you know, praying with the scriptures, using the scriptures at, to help us with our life of prayer, um, Lexio Divina, and, and so forth. There's much we could say here. Uh, and then finally, the gospel reading, which underlines the, the persistence of, of prayer. Um, so, yes, we've covered a lot of ground. Is there any other uh, last thoughts before we finish? Very good. Could you lead us in prayer, uh, uh, Father Bruce? Would that be okay? Uh, no, I don't feel like praying today. No, uh, 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 I'll do it. All right. Let's close. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your Son and the gift of your scriptures. May they always guide us and help us to uh, uh, learn more fully to place our trust in your providence and may we always persevere in that trust and we make our prayer through christ our lord amen okay. all right thank you